Hi, everybody. Thank you for making time to join this Take the Lead Yapster uh, webinar. We really appreciate you making the time to join us. This will be the first in a number of series where we talk about um, best practice in this emerging field of social leadership and how that's affecting businesses all across the economy for the better in a whole range of different ways. So let's start by asking ourselves or reminding ourselves what is social leadership? So social leadership is just a mix of social media. So typically those consumer platforms that we all waste all of our time when we're not on Netflix, on our laptops and, and smartphones, combined with classic leadership communications. So leadership communications is all about aligning and inspiring people around a cause. So when you put modern technology and social networking software together with classic leadership techniques and objectives, you get social leadership. Now, the reason we believe so strongly in social leadership at Yapster is we think it is an irresistible, irreversible, inevitable trend, just continuing a long line in, in human history. If you look back through human history, what you'll see is every time the primary technology that underpins uh, society with communication changes, the dominant type of that leader for that era tends to change as well. So famously, the image there on the top right is, is that era of the King's Speech, um, where a monarch went from being able to lead his subjects by standing on a balcony and issuing press releases to having to speak to subjects where they were, which is in their living rooms, crowded around a radio. And then in the bottom left, you see um, President Reagan, the first movie star president that thrived in the television era because he had a 40 year career in TV and film. And of course, most recently, we've had the mass adoption of the smartphone. Uh, iPhone was invented in 2007. So just a blink of an eye ago in historical terms. And we all know what that's done to modern electoral politics um, out in the wider world, for better, for worse. And actually, increasingly, what we're seeing now is those same technologies and trends are changing workplaces, too. So it's a big event, this, um, this new epoch in communication technology and, and leadership. And we're seeing that it's creating amazing um, competitive opportunities across the economy. And we're very pri privileged at Yapster, because we are a social leadership platform, that we get to see customers innovating with um, technology and these new leadership digitally enabled leadership techniques to impact their businesses. So at the moment, um, employee retention is a huge topic of interest, again, all the way across the economy, but particularly in the sectors that we specialize in, the sort of frontline service economy. Of course, following the coronavirus pandemic, lockdowns, uh, Brexit, at least here in the UK, um, it is proving increasingly difficult to, to keep hold of, of good people in the service industries. And so that means that businesses and leaders are asking themselves quite rightly, what can we do to hold on to our best people? Um, now, there's lots of things you can do outside of social leadership, and many of you that have joined this webinar will already be expert in those things. So I won't dwell on those, those areas. Um, what we're going to talk about is what you can do as a social leader to impact your employee retention effort. And we think actually it can make perhaps the biggest impact of all of the tools at your disposal from an employee retention perspective. Okay, so what do the best social leaders do when it comes to employee retention? Well, the first thing that they do is they express gratitude, which sounds incredibly obvious, but actually, when we look at the data, and I'll come on to data a little later, sadly, not a lot of people do it, or at least don't do it at scale. So why does expressing gratitude as a social leader drive employee retention? So you can read, so I won't just reread the note. But the key point here is that um, people often feel unvalued when they're not. As a leader, one of the things that's, that's, um, that's most frustrating is you can think and feel something, but the people that you're looking to align and inspire can't mind read. They don't necessarily know what you think and feel. You have to be overt, ex expressly communicative about those things. So it's actually quite rare for a manager or a leader to not feel gratitude for their people, even though it's very common to fail to express that gratitude. Um, now, that's a real shame because actually, businesses are always struggling for resources, even in abundant times, people are competing for budgets. But actually, in these sort of lean times post crisis, budgets are really hard to come by. And the great thing about social leadership and the expression of gratitude is that financially, it doesn't cost a lot. It's inexpensive. And it's inarguable that it boosts performance. So just think about your own career and how much harder you've worked for people that you um, believe value what you do. Same applies in your personal life. 
Now, that leads on to the fact that it's basically alchemy. If you think about it, it's cheap for you. It requires a bit of, you know, a couple of minutes to, um, to take the time to, if you're going to do it digitally, remember this is all about social leadership. It might take you a couple of minutes to open your employee communication system, pick out the person that you want to recognize and say thank you to them, either directly or in front of their peers using something like the newsfeed. But it's like a minute. The value that that can, can bring to the other person is much more than, than whatever the financial cost of a minute of your time is. So it is effectively alchemy. You're leveraging that time. Every minute that you spend being grateful has a massive, massive multiplier effect on the other side. Um, alchemy is, of course, the sort of historical mythical science of turning base metals into silver and gold. A bit dramatic, I know, but I think the point still stands. So um, the last two points I want to make here on this before we move on to the next sort of theme that social leaders, um, tend, the great social leaders tend to follow, is this idea of building safe spaces at work. So there's a fairly straightforward trend. When you express gratitude to people, they trust that you value what they do. Makes sense, doesn't it? When people trust that you value them, they feel safe at work. Now, that doesn't mean that they think they've got a job for life. If they stop performing, stop living up to the, the business's um, cultural or operational aspirations. But it means that they trust that when they do something well, you'll recognize it. And that creates a sense of safety, right? So gratitude leads to trust. Trust leads to feelings of safety. And there's an enormous body of social science that shows that when people feel safe, they perform better. Although classic sort of 1950s management orthodoxy would say that the right way to get the most out of people is to sort of inspire fear. Actually, the right way to, in, to inspire people is, yes, hold them accountable, but make them feel safe that they, so that they can bring their best self to work. When people are bringing their best self to work and they don't feel threatened and anxious about their position in the organization and their relationship with you, they're more likely to perform well. And then people that are performing well tend to enjoy their, their role more. And then, of course, they tend to stay particularly if the reason that they're enjoying their work is because you are uniquely providing the sort of soft side of the employment experience, which most organizations sadly don't. So if you look at the images up on screen here now, this is just one example of the many social leaders that we've got the privilege of working for within Yapster. This is Neil Seba, he's the MD of TOS. The reason I'm sharing these images, because of course all images that get shared within Yapster are private to those organizations, is because Neil very kindly joined one of our webinars a few months ago. So you can see on the screen there just some simple examples of where Neil's expressing gratitude to the people in his organization. Now, he does do this in one to one and group messages by location. But here we're showing the newsfeed because, of course, these instances of expressing gratitude have actually rolled across the whole organization because he's doing it in a place where everybody can see. This is something you could start doing today or tomorrow if you're not already. Um, there definitely will be things that people, that people are doing within your business that you feel gratitude for. So that's number one. So what, what's the second thing that great social leaders do to drive their employee retention agendas? This is all about data and it's all about monitoring engagement. There's a lot of talk about data in the modern economy and um, you know, colleagues in finance and business planning are, are typically most comfortable with this. Now we do work with those functions and executive functions. We also work a lot with the sort of the departments that sometimes have a reputation for being the soft side of organizations like HR, comms. The cool thing about social leadership is it's giving hard data to functions that sometimes feel like they're on the soft side of businesses. And it's enabling those people to show the hard impact, i.e. the engagement impact of what they do on the business. And which in many times is actually driving the financial performance that the, um, uh, the spreadsheet folks so enjoy analyzing later. So monitoring engagement is all about supplementing gut feel. Great managers and leaders are always talking about gut feel. Social leadership doesn't undermine that. What you're able to do with social leadership data is you can check that your gut feel is right. So just a couple of questions to consider. Do you know who the influencers are within your company? Now, influencers are different to leaders. I'll come on to that. Influencers are people that drive the culture drive the narrative within an organization. You don't need to be hierarchically superior to be an influencer in an organization. And that can be great if the people that are your influencers that are lower down the hierarchy are in fact um, representative of the culture and the strategy that, that you endorse. Now, of course, if they're not, and you've ceded the opportunity to influence to those folks by not being an active social leader and not participating actively across your workplace community, then that means those influencers are going to be driving 
your business in the direction that you didn't intend. You can only know that if you're looking at the data to understand who does seem to be the most influential. When you think about influence, that's a combination of activity, because you can't be influential if you're not doing anything, and then impact of activity. So who's reading what, how often, who's liking, who's commenting. From that, we can infer the influence of a given individual within a social leadership environment or a Yapster workspace. Do you run agile experiments to increase employee engagement? So the stakes are really high now, higher than they've ever been when it comes to retaining employees. And you can make some big bets, like putting a, um, a rewards and recognition system in. Maybe you can do bonuses. Maybe you can do an, an annual conference with very lavish sort of prizes and recognition. That's great. And a lot of those things are relatively well trodden. And so the risk feels relatively low. You know what the cost is and you kind of know what the impact has been in prior years. But actually, if you want to operate on the bleeding edge of your business, both social leadership and other emerging technologies or, or management trends, the safest way to do that is to act to innovate in what we call an agile fashion. So agile innovation is all about running experiments and looking for clues as to whether they're working or not at the earliest possible opportunity. And then you double down on the things that do work. So from a social leadership perspective, if we link back to the point I just made about gratitude, you could look at um, the engagement data in turn measured by the, um, the social activity, the levels of activity within a given district or even on a site level before and after your key leaders start expressing gratitude um, specifically to that target group. Based on what we see within Yapster, I can tell you now that the engagement level will go up and the employee NPS will almost certainly go up as well. And when those two things go up, those are generally leading indicators of uh, employee retention going up as well. That could be gratitude. There's lots more things that you can do. You can run, you can run KPI games, for example, also, which is more around driving sales. But actually, if you do it in a fun way, again, you can see what that does to, to engagement within your social leadership platform. And if it's working, you can double down and you can do more of it. But it's all about running experiments, being creative, but then being quantitative on the other end when you look at the data to ascertain how well you've done. So I talked a moment ago about influencers. Now, leaders should be influencers because as a leader, generally the role of a leader is to not do as such. It's to inspire and align others to do things uh, in, in the right direction so leaders get leverage. Now, it's great to be a leader that's physically present, that you know, kisses babies and shake hands in sites. But if you have any meaningful number of sites, by definition, your leader's always going to be not in more sites than he or she is in, right? They can only be in one room at the time. That's why digital influence and social leadership is so important the further you go up the, um, the organizational pyramid. So as the if, well, even if you're not the CEO of the organization, if you're in any role where you have a strong professional or personal interest in the health of your organization and practice of social leadership, you need to be able to look at the data and understand whether those that the business is paying to align and inspire people are in fact doing that. And social leadership data will enable you to do that. And great social leaders are all over engagement data for the reasons that I've just mentioned. And then finally, I've, I've talked about, I think I said the word lagging indicator a moment ago. Now, in our business, in the technology business, we also have leading and lagging indicators. All businesses do. Your profit and loss account is a lagging indicator. It's, it, it's reflective of what you did in the prior financial year, for better, for worse. But you could be about to lose all of your customers because you just pushed them to past breaking point. So they paid, you know, paid their fees in full or endured the last price rise that, that unexpectedly was imposed but they're not going to come back next year. So that would be an example where the lagging indicator shows that you're doing well, but the leading indicator in the example I just gave that might be um, customer satisfaction is actually going down. Now, from an organizational health perspective and an employee retention perspective, you can actually get a really good clue about what's about to happen in labor turnover when you look at engagement activity rates, both on the, on, uh, at the sort of leadership level and on the frontline level. It's really interesting, even in a period that we've just gone through now, where everybody's had some degree of high turnover, we're able to see and predict which organizations that we work with are likely to have below average labor turnover and above average labor turnover, depending on where they are in their social leadership journey and how effective those leaders are at practicing some of the techniques we're discussing. So that's worth bearing in mind when you're dealing with the finance colleagues who are typically quite anchored in lagging indicators. 
So what I'm just showing you now is an example from a data dashboard within Yapster. Now, um, this is anonymous, of course, as all of our data is. But if you look at the key on the top of those two images, you can see, um, you can see the little orange um, key so it shows that that's the customer metric. And then we've got the light blue to comparison customer. And then we've got the dark blue, which is the all customer average. So if you look at the box on the left for weekly active usage, what you can see in this case is the customer in question has relatively low levels of weekly active usage within Yapster. Um, now, we're always very transparent about this because as a social leadership platform, we need to practice what we preach and we need to make database decisions and be transparent as we encourage our leaders to do. So you can see here that the conversation we have with the customer is for some reason you're your activity, your social leadership activity across your organization is quite a long way below our all customer average. And it's significantly below the best in class company in your category. That's the light blue line at the top. And to their great credit, this customer, and you can see those orange lines follow all the way through the, the core dashboards that we make available. And there's many, many more. This customer in questions looked at it and said, oh, well, that's really interesting. We're actually going through a transformation at the moment. A lot of our, because the business was, was uh, changed ownership recently. And, and actually some of those that previously would have been our social leaders uh, are no longer with the business. And we've got a new leadership team, new strategy, new everything. This actually shows us that we really need to start thinking seriously about our digital activity because our business is too big for us to transform it and move it forward physically site by site at a time. We're never going to be able to get round, um, round those teams. So I would strongly encourage you if you are EAPS the customer, if you're not EAPS the customer, I would strongly uh, advise you to dig this data out from whatever you are using um, to make sure that you're monitoring engagement because if the numbers are low, like the orange line I showed you there, that's a pretty strong indicator that you're going to start suffering employee labor turnover that's above what you, what you need to experience just by virtue of not being able to express gratitude at scale and do some of the other things that we're going to be talking about, like asking for feedback. So asking for feedback is different to expressing gratitude, of course. Asking for feedback is, I think, more difficult. I think many people find asking for feedback more difficult than um, saying well done to colleagues because asking for feedback exposes you to, um, to some vulnerability. Somebody might tell you that what you're doing doesn't work for them or isn't effective for the organization. Great social leaders overcome that fear and do actively solicit feedback anyway. And the reason that they do that, well, the reasons are myriad, and I'll just go through a couple now. As I mentioned earlier, leaders have leverage, right? For every manager or leader in an organization, there typically are five, 10, sometimes hundreds or thousands of folks that work under that individual within the organizational pyramid. So as a leader, if you're doing something that's misinformed, misguided, that's based on the information that was available to you, but you didn't have all the information, as is always the case in large, hugely complex organizations, your impact is going to be leveraged. So it's actually a gift to be given feedback by colleagues that can tell you the unintended impacts of what you're doing. But the only way that they're going to do that is if they feel safe, what we talked about previously, but also if you actively set an example of asking for feedback so that folks know not only is it okay to give feedback, but it is expected, it's required in service of building a great business that people want to work for and stay with critically. Now, this isn't just, you can't just set the example as a top level leader and hope for the best. You also need to demonstrate to the, the folks that are also in leadership positions, perhaps sort of mid-level leadership positions, that they too should be asking for feedback and actively um, responding positively to, to good or fair feedback that comes their way. The last thing that you want to do is create an organization that's incredibly brittle because all of the folks that are in leadership positions are dictatorial, dictatorial rather than communicative. Now, being communicative doesn't mean that you need to get bullied and accept feedback that's not fair or misguided. It just means you need to be open to it so that your organization can be responsive. People can feel empowered. And when people feel empowered, they tend to do their best work, but they also do tend to stay with an organization longer because they're much more easily able to express themselves at work. Now, I've just mentioned resilience, but let's just spend just a couple of seconds more on it because I think it's super relevant to the period that we've just been through. When you're able to give feedback in an organization and it's actually listened to, you can th fix things more quickly. The more people in your organization there are, the more opportunities there are to spot and, th and fix things more quickly. 
won't name any names, but through the last year, we've seen some remarkable feats of crisis communications and leadership, both at the top level and at the mid level and at the front line within organizations, uh, some of the organizations that we work with, it's been a real privilege. There are other organizations that we don't necessarily work with and maybe one or two that we, where actually there's an aspiration to be digitally equipped and enabled, but there's not necessarily a culture of soliciting feedback and acting on it. And in those situations, whilst many of those businesses have survived and will be fine, a lot of them are on a journey, the last year was clearly much harder because actually there was some brittleness in the organization, even if it was recognized and being worked on. And that just meant that as facts kept changing every time Boris gave an announcement, there was a brittleness and a rigidity through the organization that just meant they just couldn't respond as quickly as those super fluid, flexible organizations that had feedback at the central of their DNA. It's just part of their culture. Feedback also doesn't just make you resilient to when things go wrong. It actually enables you to be responsive, uh, agile and creative when you see opportunities to do things right, to do things differently or better. You can see the, 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 in the brackets there, debate, change, improve. That's typically a cycle for feedback. It doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong. Somebody can say, hey, I think if we change this or if you change that, we can get, you know, five, 10 percent more in X. That's a huge opportunity and not one that you should pass up, particularly if you've got social leadership technology at your disposal. Uh, there's a fire station below our office, so forgive that. OK, now last point that social leaders will practice in order to drive. Oh, no, forgive me. I forgot that I had this fantastic example from Burger King. So Burger King Scandinavia have a made my day difficult form. We call these the applications. So it's in the apps tab of Yapster. Um, this is awesome. This is a simple form that's, that's linked from, from within the Yapster um, application that allows any colleague across Burger King Scandinavia to very, very quickly articulate at scale in an organized fashion to business leadership what's going on on the front line that's making their job more difficult than it needs to be. So this isn't personalized feedback. This is organizational feedback. Terrifically powerful, provided you then take those items for feedback and then think about them and action them quickly, which the, which the team here do. So this has been a really exciting innovation. It's one that we're quite keen to see more of our customers replicate as a way of scaling and institutionalizing feedback from the very top to the bottom of the organization. OK, so the last thing that we want to draw to your, bring to your attention that, that great social leaders do uh, in pursuit of their, I mean, for, in many cases, a lot of the things I'm describing to you are things that come naturally to great leaders. And then it happens that that happens to drive down um, uh, labor turnover, which is brilliant. So here's the last thing that they tend to do, both individually and on an organizational basis. They keep lines of communication open. Silos do form naturally in human organizations. You probably remember being at school and there were little cliques in the class that emerged. And then similarly, in almost every workplace that you've ever been in, the business will, be, will have been divided into functional departments. That's completely normal. We tend to, you know, it, it works for productivity to be clustered with people performing similar roles to us. But if we're not careful, that causes silos, which in turn means breakdowns in communication between functions, groups of people that don't know each other that well personally, don't particularly know what one another are working on, don't know the challenges and the opportunities that might be presented to those other parts of the organization. Great social leaders recognize that whilst businesses do need to be organized into functions, silos need to be mitigated. And the way to do that is to have infrastructure, technology, but also cultural habits that drive open communication. It is a fact that employees that, that know more tend to care more. Again, we saw this a lot through the coronavirus crisis. There were some um, CEOs, MDs, regional leaders that would do habitual trading updates, speak literally into a video camera, and in some cases disclose quite sensitive trading information. Now that won't be right for everybody, but for those organizations, it was incredible the trust that that engendered in their workforces. And by knowing more, the individuals could understand the impact that they could make on, on the business. By understanding that impact, particularly when you tie it into gratitude from earlier in this talk, it makes people feel empowered, recognized, worthwhile. And of course, that then in turn um, has an impact on labor retention. So please don't assume that frontline colleagues or colleagues in other functions are not interested in what you're doing. 
all of our data shows us that that's not true, actually, that colleagues are more interested than you think. And the great thing about delivering information through digital technology is it's asynchronous, which means people can consume that when it works for them. So it's not as interruptive or as intrusive as saying, hey, can I get five minutes to tell you about something you might not be interested in? So we just talked about transparency. I think this is a really nice point, and it's something that the best social leaders do. If you run a highly operational business, it's quite likely that there will be something of an engineering culture in your organization in that there'll be very, very robust operating playbooks. There'll be quite a strong um, compliance culture in the organization. There's some things that just need to get done. That's fine. I'm not suggesting that that's not right at all. What I'm talking about is the human organization and the relationships and the connectivity between people. As a leader, as a social leader, both in setting up the system at the social leadership platform and in practicing social leadership within it, you have the opportunity to nurture the culture and the community and those information flows. But think of it more like gardening than like engineering. An engineer preordains the way something's going to work. A machine works the way the engineer designed it to work. Garden's not like that. A garden, you plant certain plants in different parts of a garden, and therefore you expect that plant to bloom in the place that you put it. And you might even trim branches for the health of the tree or the health of the garden. What you're not looking to do is to micromanage and control every direction in which things happen. That's terrifically powerful for creating an organization where you can have functional departments that drive productivity, but actually you allow magical things to happen when empowered people take the initiative. And that then just brings on to the last point here about innovation. When you think of your workplace community like a garden in which, of which you're the gardener to just make it healthy and have things roughly in the right place, what will happen is some parts of the organization, both departments and individuals, will overlap in wonderful expected ways. And again, there's a huge body of social science and business uh, literature that shows that innovation quite often happens at the intersection of things, at the intersection of cultures, at the intersection of departments. And the reason for that is effectively you get fusions of ideas, fusions of circumstance, where two things just naturally come together and you see something through a different, uh, from a different perspective. And then if you've got an open communicative culture where feedback and ideas are appreciated, those two groups of people might come together and come up with something that you never expected. So this again is, this is Yapster specific, but within Yapster, the way that we try and create um, open communication for an organization is through our uh, find tab. So in the find tab, we take a feed directly from the, the company HR system, which means that every night, at least every night, we're able to see, and every user of Yapster within a company is able to see who are all of the colleagues, how do they split across uh, various roles and across locations? And that means that if you want to ask somebody a question in a particular department or uh, arrange it, let's say in hospitality or retail, you wanna arrange cover for a shift, from a nearby location, you're able to do that in a way that you wouldn't have been able to do if you weren't connected in a single space. So it's partly about having a platform, but then it's about configuring it so that it's not deeply restricted. We can apply those restrictions, but we generally encourage organizations not to. And then it's about creating a culture and setting an example as a social leader that it's okay, it's awesome when functions collaborate and communicate across your digital workspace. If you set your system up in that way and you practice the things that I've just um, spent the last half an hour or so talking you through, you absolutely will see activity and engagement climb in the App Store or whatever social leadership platform you use, and you will see labor turnover come down. So I know times are tough at the moment, as they always are, but um, I hope that what we've been through today helps in some way. This is a series, the Take the Lead series, so we're going to be uh, tackling a whole range of business opportunities and challenges over the coming period and talk about how social leadership, both the technology and the practices uh, can help you capitalize on those opportunities or overcome those challenges. So thanks, thanks so much for spending the time uh, with me. Hopefully I'll see you next time.